Good evening, friends, colleagues, students. Very good to see you all. I'm Zainab Badawi, and I am hosting this first ever Question Time International here at SOAS at the School of, I hope I get this right, the Centre for Colonialism, Empire, and International Law. Very interesting name for a centre. And um, the aim of our event today is to try to exchange views and ideas between practitioners of international law, students such as yourselves and interested people in general and um, <clears throat> some academics. You can hear my voice is not quite at its full strength because I succumbed to that uh, cold, flu, whatever it was over Christmas. So, And plus I shout too much at my four children, so that's not helped matters. So um, <clears throat> I'm very glad to have the use of this microphone. I'm going to introduce our panel. We're going to um, be assembled here for about an hour and a half, and uh, I hope you'll find that our um, <clears throat> exchange is um, thought-provoking, lively, food for thought, and heat as well as light. I'm going to introduce the panel in alphabetical order. Professor Stephen Chan, somebody most of you know, Professor of International Relations here at uh, SOAS, and a good friend of mine, lovely man, Stephen. I say nothing in my defense, I'm totally biased. <laughs> and um, Stephen has, uh, of course, written extensively on international relations and Africa. He's an old hand um, at Africa. He worked in um, Uganda after the fall of Idi Amin. He's advised various African governments on how to do things. He's written on Zimbabwe, a biography of Robert Mugabe, and also published conversations with the current Prime Minister Morgan Changarai. And uh, he's advised, as I said, so many governments, uh, Kenya, Z Zambia, Zimbabwe, um, Eritrea, Ethiopia. And his book, which is a must read, his most recent work is The End of Certainty Towards a New Internationalism. And uh, in 2010, Stephen was awarded an OBE, and he said, I never sought this award, but after a few glasses of champagne, I decided I was very happy with it. <laughs> so Stephen, <laughs> congratulations. Um, our <clears throat> next panel member, Professor David Kennedy, sitting here to my right. He's faculty director of the Institute for Global Law and Policy, professor of law at Harvard Law School, and also at SOAS. And in fact, this Question Time International has being set at a time to coincide with his annual teaching time at uh, SOAS. He's a practicing law and consultant, so not just sitting in his ivory tower as an academic. He's worked on numerous projects at the United Nations and the European Commission. And um, he is currently chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Advisory Council on Global Governance. And you know, um, David Kennedy's research explores issues of global governance, development policy, and the nature of professional expertise. His um, most recent books include The Dark Sides of Virtue, Reassessing International Humanitarianism and of War and Law. And these works were described as disturbing, shattering, provocative, and iconoclastic. Well, I'm quite intimidated sitting next to you <laughs> after all that, David. But David's work is often regarded as uncomfortable, but always uh, essential reading for international lawyers. To my left, another David. Uh, somebody who needs very little introduction, of course, David Miliband, the MP for South Shields. Uh, David has, of course, been for a decade and a half at the very top of British government and politics. Um, of course, he worked for several years as um, leader of Labour's policy renewal under Tony Blair. And uh, he was the youngest foreign secretary in 30 years since David Owen. He was foreign secretary from 2007 to 2010, and also he was secretary of state for the environment where he worked on the legally binding emissions reduction bill. And um, David is married to the violinist Louise Shackleton and he has two sons. And welcome to you, David Miliband. And finally, <laughs> Peter. <laughs> 
Gita Segel is an award-winning filmmaker, a writer and an activist on issues such as race, religion, communalism, feminism and multiculturalism and human rights. She was a founder of an organisation called Women Against Fundamentalism and um, has done other works in this kind of regard. She's won a TV award for her War Crimes Fire, which is a documentary looking at war crimes allegedly committed during the conflicts in Bangladesh. And most recently, Gita was head of the gender unit at Amnesty International. And Gita thinks that although she's been a human rights advocate all her life, every issue she's worked on, things like domestic violence, women who kill, fundamentalism, that these women's issues have not been regarded as mainstream human rights by human rights organisations. And um, that's something we hope will be put right in this decade, long overdue. And Gita is very comfortable here because she's a history graduate of SOAS. So that's our panel. Welcome to you all. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> our first question, please, is from Siavash Esgi, PhD student here at SOAS. Siavash, your question, please. Hi. Um, is WikiLeaks good for international diplomacy? Oh, right. Well, that's a very good one. Um, I'm sure you've all been reading your uh, WikiLeaks and uh, all the various descriptions. I think, David Miliband, that's uh, one for you. I mean, the revelations are mostly about American um, foreign policy thoughts sent by their ambassadors from various countries. But... Um, What's your response? Well, I think that the fact and the consequence of WikiLeaks is bad for diplomacy, but the content of WikiLeaks could be quite good for diplomacy. So let me explain. The fact of a leak of two and a half million documents uh, is obviously uh, dangerous because I think it will inhibit the sort of serious dialogue that any international system uh, depends on. I think the consequence of uh, WikiLeaks is going to be an American uh, system which clams up in quite a dangerous way, and I think that's not very uh, helpful. Uh, the fact that might be beneficial, or the, uh, the content that might be beneficial, is that actually if you read uh, the cables, you notice a couple of things. First of all, there's a striking consistency between what the American government was saying in public and what it was saying in private, and that's actually rather a good testimonial to the way in which diplomacy uh, works and I think is worth uh, noting. Secondly, I think that as someone who was responsible for a diplomatic service of about 16,000 uh, people, it's worth saying that at a time when it's fashionable to take hits at public servants and at civil servants in general, the overall level of uh, reporting and insight was pretty high. And I hope that in a minor way, it might contribute to a sense of pride in public service. Thank you. David Kennedy? I think, by and large, I agree with David about, about the consequences and the significance of WikiLeaks for diplomacy. I just add one observation from the American scene, and that is the very close way in which the, way, the diplomatic conversation tracked the conversation in the established media. So it wasn't just that what the American government was saying was more or less in line with what the diplomats were writing home but also the conversation among informed elites within the United States followed very similar lines, and I think that's the reason that there was so little surprise about a large number of the uh, revelations that have come to light, at least so far. But if we ask what we can learn from that, I think one of the things we can learn is that the art of diplomacy is a very narrow conversation, a very, very narrow in its preoccupations, in the way in which it interprets events, very focused on individuals, very focused on the particular issues that have come to attract the attention of the media or of the political leadership at a particular moment, very bad at longer term reflective thinking about things. Uh, and in that sense, uh, the, con the concerns that are common to the establishment media, the diplomatic establishment and our political leadership are not the concerns of the large majority of people in the world. They're simply talking about something else. Peter, is WikiLeaks good for international diplomacy or is it uh, irresponsible and an attack on the international community, as the Americans said? 
Well, I, I think we're all going to be poring over the Wiki, WikiLeaks, but um, I'd actually like to look at the issue of the, the logs, the war logs that were released before uh, the diplomatic cables. And uh, I think there's an issue there that certainly supporters of WikiLeaks have um, really sidelined and uh, refused to look at, and that is the danger to civilians, for instance, Afghan civilians, uh, that was pointed out by the Afghan Human Rights Commission, which is nobody's stooge. Uh, you know, they have a very, very hard job um, trying to, uh, you know, tread the right lines in human rights. And I think the human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, wrote to WikiLeaks protesting about the threat to civilians from their names not being redacted. And a lot of the left has, um, who support Assange for, uh, for a lot of good reasons, but has said there's no evidence that these logs will do any harm and so on. Precisely the point that the Afghan Human Rights Commission was making was that we, they don't have the capacity to monitor every individual in every village who was ever visited by a NATO soldier. Mm. And you know that, that could have a really detrimental effect. Nobody would condone, I suppose, jeopardizing the safety of people who perhaps may have given information and so on. But if their safety had been guaranteed and their names and identities redacted, do you think that the leaks were, were a good thing? I think there's such a huge thing that we're still working out what, you know, is this a one-off or is this going to change international diplomacy and the way in which, uh, uh, you know, people conduct themselves. And I think the, you know, the young cyber warriors who are, um, you know, say this is a good thing because it holds governments accountable. I think two of the foundational principles of human rights are accountability so that states should be held accountable for, um, you know, doing privately what they say they're doing publicly. That's, that's one issue. Uh, but the other is privacy. And if there is no privacy, um, and certainly the privacy of states is different from the privacy of the individuals, but what basically was said to me, I've talked to people who, you know, are part of the whole international movement around WikiLeaks, and they said, there is no privacy anymore, which is probably something that they've learned, you know, harder than my generation has, that you can find out anything about anybody on the internet. There is no privacy, and that has been one of the foundations of human rights, that people are entitled to privacy uh, against um, unauthorized interference in their affairs. And I think that larger issue is, is something that we've barely begun to address. All right. We're just addressing the question, Stephen Chan. It is uh, WikiLeaks, is it good for international diplomacy, all those revelations that were made? I think that in the long run, we're going to see this as a benefit. So I'm going to differ a little bit from my colleague uh, panelists. I think there are dangers. I think those dangers have been well pointed out. I was particularly upset also that a number of people who are out of the Western spotlight were named as if their fates and destinies meant nothing as if this whole thing was simply a crusade directed against one or two superpowers and the fate of ordinary people came to nothing. So they could be named without any kind of consequence. I think that's a terrible, as it were, arrogance on the part of the people organizing this. At the same time, I think that the whole issue of public diplomacy is a very, very real one. I think as early as Woodrow Wilson uh, in the early part of the 20th century, that was an American president who made, as it were, a fundamental stand about the need for transparent and public diplomacy. Now, having said that, I don't think there has been a real drift towards private diplomacy of the sort that is suggested by the idea of WikiLeaks as expose. Almost all of this information that was revealed was, in fact, known to very, very wide circles of people. In fact, a lot of this information came from circulation lists, which were as large as 3,000 people. In other words, what you have is a distinction between what was, strictly speaking, secret once upon a time uh, and what is public, an intermediate space where you have an, an elite monopolization of diplomatic conversations. Um, what I was really struck by in these so-called elite need-to-know conversations was how shallow the conversations were. So I echoed David Kennedy's point. So much about personalities, you know, this president, this minister does this, this minister thinks that, this prime minister thinks that, as if the underlying substance of human thought, philosophy, and belief, those driving forces that make people stand up and rebel, as if those fundamental issues had nothing to do with diplomacy. And in that kind of conversation, I think what the WikiLeaks revealed was just how shallow our concepts and how to practice international relations really are. Yeah, I mean, the, what was said about Gaddafi, that he was always accompanied by a buxom Ukrainian nurse, blonde nurse. Yes. The, 
just seemed to be a little bit um, odd. But Stephen Chan, I mean, when you look at some of the revelations made, I mean, look, on the 19th of this month, you've got the um, Hu Jintao, the Chinese president, visiting America. And then when you look at the revelations that the top US um, official on Africa, Johnny Carson, was talking about China's role in Africa, describing it as aggressive and pernicious economic competition without morals. I mean, huh, that's not going to help them very much, is it? When they're saying, oh, we're friends, we like you, Beijing. And actually, this is what they think about their role in Africa. Well, don't forget the Chinese use exactly the same kind of language. It's just that WikiLeaks people can't understand Chinese very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I've been involved in enough negotiations in Beijing. On the African side, I hasten to add, um, to understand that, that this goes both ways. You're not going to have, as it were, a sanitized zone in diplomatic conversations. And of course, the Chinese reply is, who are you to talk? Uh, the West has been just as much bully boys in the whole African historical situation as you're accusing us of being now. Mm. I don't think this is going to cause any long-term harm, but I do stress that this kind of conversation does act both ways. But I mean, it, it just as an observer of Africa, and obviously because you were also a member of the trilateral US, China, and Africa, uh, board, wasn't it, sometime in the last decade. Do you think that it does reveal to you how wary the United States is of the role of China in Africa, or didn't tell you anything you hadn't, no, didn't know? I think that the Americans in particular are not so much wary of China's presence in Africa. China's been in Africa for a very, very long time, although the manifestation of this has changed in recent years. What gets the Americans is they can't guess beforehand what the Chinese are going to do. You know, the Chinese wrong foot them. And this is a fault of American diplomacy and not a fault of Chinese maneuvers. Okay, and David Miliband, very quick before we go to the floor, you said that actually it didn't really learn anything new and what's been said in private is pretty much what's been expressed in public. And you don't think it's damaging when the Americans, what was it, described Putin as an alpha dog and President Medvedev playing Robin to Putin's Batman and... You can, read that, you can read that in The Economist or The Financial Times or even hear it on the BBC uh, quite uh, regularly. Look, there was a fundamental breach of trust and no society can operate when breach of trust is seen as having no consequences. So uh, I think it's important to say that very, very clearly. Where there was the greatest dissonance between public words and private words was not in the case of the United States, as it happens. The biggest revelation was what... Uh, Gulf states were saying about Iran. Now, it wasn't a revelation to those of us who've been studying it or those of us who have spent time in the Gulf states, but it was a quote-unquote revelation for the wider world. And I think that says something about open societies versus closed societies. And so we can have, a, I think, a, a good debate about what's been right and what's been wrong about American policy. Sure. But the WikiLeaks does not re reveal a dissonance between what is said to be the policy and what is actually the policy. The dissonance occurs in other countries which are much more closed societies than our own. Did you find out anything? I mean, you, you mentioned the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, saying we want an Arab-led military force to go and take out Hezbollah in Lebanon because, of course, they don't like them. I mean, well, I did you very, know about that? I didn't know that the American government felt or that the American representatives in London felt that I was going on too much about human rights, which they reported back to Washington. <laughs> so that was quite a nice thing to read. Um, but, um, I mean, none of us have been through all two and a half million uh, documents or pages or, uh, that, that have been released. But I think that uh, the truth is that if they hadn't been marked secret, they would have seemed much less exciting than uh, they did. I have to say, I don't think we would ever on the BBC describe Vladimir Putin as an alpha dog. But there we go. I think we'd have to delete that bit. But anyway, uh, questioner, did that answer your question? Yeah, okay, questions from the floor on this. Was WikiLeaks good for international diplomacy? And then we'll move on. Can I say, anybody who wants to make an intervention from the floor, please keep it very brief, because I am a very horrible chair, and I will just cut you off in your prime if you go on for too long. Any questions? I've scared you all. No? How many hands international diplomacy has been improved by WikiLeaks? Been detrimental, irresponsible for the international, is responsible an attack on the international community? <laughs> I thought you had strong, Welcome vigorous opinions here at SOAS. You're all sitting on the fence. Okay. <laughs> 
Our next question is uh, Rose Parfit, another PhD student here at SOAS. Rose, your question. <laughs> Hi. Um, does the panel agree that the current financial crisis um, has exposed the limits of the existing state and interstate um, arrangements for economic management? Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, Stephen. Did you get the question? No. Here it. Can we no. The question again? <laughs> Are you going to answer it? Just say the question again, a bit slower sure. and louder. Does the panel agree that the, um, that the existing financial crisis has exposed the limits of the existing state and interstate um, arrangements for, uh, for economic management? Okay, so it's about the much-beloved international financial architecture of Gordon Brown. <laughs> well... <laughs> Paraphrase the question. Yes. The much we'll come to you in a moment, David. Yes. <laughs> the much beloved economic and financial architecture of uh, Gordon Brown was not so different from the much beloved architecture of many other countries. Uh, I think that where you've got to look at this question is not so much is this a crisis for the economy as we understand it, or is this a crisis for the economy as we do not understand it? In other words, I think that one of the key underlying things that we often miss is that we don't in fact have, in SOAS terms, a crisis of capitalism here at all. And what we do have is a shift in terms of the ownership of capitalism. And again, this has not been widely remarked upon, and that is that the global economy is in fact in very rude health. The big question is who owns the rude, healthy part of the global economy? When you've got countries like China able to buy up American toxic debt, for instance, and when you see them coming in, offering to be of great assistance to countries teetering on the brink, as it were, such as Portugal, then you realize that there are certain shifts going on in the international community. Uh, the whole realignment of global politics with Africa, very anxious, for instance, to come on side with the Chinese, shows that some people recognize this. So when you look at the global architecture, it's not a case of the global architecture being in decay. It's very much a case of who is going to be the principal tenant in the penthouse of the global architecture. Okay. David Kennedy? Uh, it's an interesting question. I think that the social and political consequences of the economic crisis are still out in front of us. So we can't see yet how that will, the impact it will have on our international governance structures in full. And I think there's an optimistic story, which is that in the immediate moments of the crisis, there was a retreat to public authority by many economic actors who considered themselves global, and there was a surge of new forms of cooperation. The G8 become the G20, uh, new efforts within Europe to try to come to a common uh, solution to a variety of different regulatory problems. The longer term story, it seems to me, is less optimistic, because what the crisis revealed is a fundamental disconnection between a global economy and a national political system. So politics continues to be the domain of territorial national populations and is largely the prerogative of a middle class, at least in the developed world, that's not very mobile and to whom capital doesn't move very easily. Whereas the economy is a much more global phenomenon. And developing an international political economy, embedding the global economy in a sensible regulatory structure will continue to be a challenge as long as they're happening at different scales and are managed or owned by different players. And that tension is one that I think will preoccupy governments and policymakers for some time. David Miliband, your response to this question? Um, I, I'm much more with the second professor than the first professor. I'm with uh, <laughs> David Kennedy rather than Stephen Chu on this uh, question. I think he's absolutely right to say that the fundamental issue is that the economy uh, has gone international while politics is fundamentally national. I think there are three areas that uh, provide the best uh, exemplification of that in respect of your question. One is the management of macroeconomic imbalances, which are obvious in uh, the world economy today and uh, are subject to no governing authority and whether that's in respect of currency wars that are threatened not just by Americans and Chinese but also by the Brazilians yesterday, um, you can see that there are, there, there are fundamental issues. Secondly, financial regulation. Even within the European Union, huge um, disjunction has been revealed between European levels of regulation and, na and national, uh, European levels of uh, um, financial operation and national uh, regulation. Thirdly, and I think quite importantly, 
the institutions that do exist, and there are international institutions, the IMF and the World Bank are global institutions, they don't reflect the current distribution of economic power in the world, whether in respect of voting uh, shares for China, but also an interest of mine, the new uh, power in the Middle East, which is economic power in the Middle East. Uh, in the UN negotiations, uh, the oil states are grouped with the developing countries. And that really reflects a world of uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And I think that, I don't know if you're doing your thesis on uh, how to counter these problems, but if you can find some answers in those three areas, you'll be doing a, a real service. Are they trying to reform the membership with the board of the IMF and the World Bank? They are, and some, there have been some uh, mm. changes in the last G20 meeting agreed, mm. some shifts in voting uh, shares. Yeah. Um, I mean, Europeans are going to have to look quite hard at our own uh, share of this. But I mean, all of the, I'd be surprised if in the course of this uh, conversation this evening, three quarters of the questions don't come down to uh, how we share global sovereignty in a way that recognizes the new distribution of economic and political power around the world. And that has big implications for rising powers, because many of them want the benefits of a global economy without the responsibilities that come with it. And also, big implications for the developed countries who are going to be jealous of our own um, privileged positions. Okay, so if they have a say, they're going to have to pay the new big developing nations, India and China. Okay, Gita? Well, I, you know, I, I'd like to just bring it back to something quite simple, which is that when um, it seemed that we, you know, were heading into a crash and all these new regulatory structures had to be, you know, sort of rushed to uh, stop, um, as you said, there is no crisis of capitalism, Stephen, to, to sort of shore everything up. So you stop selling, slicing up debt and selling it, and you start uh, betting on commodities instead and uh, commodity prices go up and people start starving in countries like Ethiopia. I, I don't understand what these discussions were having, you know, why things like that haven't actually been able to be addressed immediately, uh, you know, quite apart from the long term, you know, the long term structures. So you're looking at the amount of money that's been put into propping up economies and private financial institutions well, and, and the, in the global financial crisis and not as much has been put in to alleviate poverty? Well, basically, it seems to me that bankers are continuing to be allowed to gamble, even though now we, you know, you could either say that this country is hugely indebted, as, as, as the coalition government is saying, and of course it's true, uh, or you could say we actually own the banks and we could be making them do something that is not as quite as dangerous as it was, and it okay. seems that they still are. Conscious of the time, because we've got a lot of questions to get through. A response from the floor to this question. Anybody want to make a comment? Or does our questioner want to come back? You heard what the panel said. No? Good. Okay. Admirably brief. Good. Next question, Dr. Stephen Hopgood, who's director of the Centre for the International Politics of Conflict, Rights and Justice. Your question, please, sir. You're over there. Oh, you don't need a microphone. That's okay. Oh, he can't, they can't hear you, you need sorry. To, you need to have a mic. How selfish of me, those people at the back <laughs> are so much further away, please. <laughs> Thank you. It's almost exactly a year since the earthquake in Haiti killed 230,000 people. There are still more than a million living in emergency tents, uh, subject to the constant threat of disease. But this comes despite the spending of billions of dollars of aid money and the presence of literally thousands of humanitarian NGOs. So is keeping people alive but homeless and in poverty the best we can expect from the modern humanitarian aid industry? Okay, so you're using uh, the situation in Haiti as a kind of peg to ask a wider question about the role of NGOs. Okay, people are talking about how um, trying to do good has gone bad. Gita? Responsibility of NGOs, I suppose, is at the core of what you're saying. I think there's a sort of um, pragmatism without vision, which ends up uh, not even doing the basic thing. So we're not even keeping people alive in Haiti. Even with the cholera epidemic, people are dying. And I mean, that was so predictable that there would be a cholera epidemic. You know, whether it was brought in by foreign peacekeepers or not, the kind of sanitary conditions that there were would lend itself to something like that happening. Um, and I think. Uh, you see this in other areas than emergency humanitarian aid. You have the Millennium Development Goals, which most countries in the world you know, have signed up to. Uh, there's been a huge amount of money poured into it, and it hasn't made a blind bit of difference to, for instance, the rates of maternal mortality. Uh, 
And I think if you go on having, um, avoiding the, inf the questions of infrastructure, of actually building an infrastructure that functions, uh, whether it's a sanitary infrastructure or education or, or other things, then you are going to end up stumbling from problem to problem. And where there, there's an immense regulatory framework, uh, you know, the, the BBC program today talked about it, a cluster system where NGOs are supposed to cooperate with each other. Um, but that regulatory framework is basically on the shelf. I mean, people don't implement it uh, in all sorts of ways. If I could just supplement the question, though, really, I mean, when you look at what's going on in Haiti, it is a very extreme situation now where you actually see NGO workers having bricks thrown at them. They are so unpopular, um, NGOs in, in Haiti. Of course, the United Nations also not escaping because they think, oh, they brought the cholera. But, you know, it does seem as though there is a huge crisis for humanitarian organisations, and it's simply exposed, hasn't it, Haiti, the uh, problem with NGOs living up to what they say they want to do. David Miliband. Um, well, a couple of things. First, I think that the um, issue that Gita referred to, that aid hasn't had the impact that maybe was expected, uh, one has to, I think, um, deconst deconstruct that a bit. The truth is that massive progress has been made on the issue of maternal mortality that you raised in those countries where aid has been combined with good governance, development of trade, and conflict prevention. The reason the statistics are as you described, the reason why there hasn't been the sort of impact uh, that might have been expected, even from the aid levels that have gone, is that aid on its own is never going to be the answer. And the aid in a, corrupt, in a society with corrupt governance, aid in a society with conflict, aid in a society with una unable to generate economic innovation and growth of its own is not going to make the difference. And I think it's important when we look at the international, it's bad enough with national averages, when you look at international averages in respect of the MDGs, it's important to distinguish between those areas where you're making real progress, those areas where you're making limited progress, and those areas where you've gone backwards. Now, the Haiti example, and maybe the professor is an expert on Haiti, in which case he should be answering the question, um, is that uh, the, um, it seems to me that it's the most chronic case of absolute state failure combined with natural calamity. And when you have that, situation for the aid agencies then to get the blame not just from people in the uh, country but from the rest of us seems to me to be pretty harsh and uh, the figures that you quoted at the beginning are, are unspeakable I mean if you even think about the uh, um, process of coping with 230,000 dead bodies and the dangers that that uh, uh, carries with mm. it never mind in a situation where the whole infrastructure of the country has been completely wrecked um, I think that it's pretty harsh to say that shows NGOs don't work. No, but, but you know, David Miliband, of course the Haitian state is really not up to doing very much. I mean, they've almost said as much. But uh, the question does say that lots of money has gone into Haiti. And when you've even got the United Nations Special Envoy for Haiti, Bill Clinton, saying to the NGO community, for heaven's sake, tell us what you're doing and where you're doing it and how you're doing it. I mean, they are well-meaning. Nobody is saying that they're not, but they are setting up health clinics without informing the Ministry of Health in Haiti that it has become just this loose-limbed giant, lack of coordination, duplication of efforts, and often inexperience where doctors go and perform operations and then just leave and they're not providing the but proper there's a fundamental, aftercare. Look, there's a fundamental point here, which is a political point, which is how do you see the role of charitable endeavour, social endeavour, in a society that uh, functions effectively? For me, you see a strong voluntary sector or a third sector alongside a government which works and a private sector which works. We've got a debate in this country about whether or not NGOs should take over responsibilities of the state. But if you try and imagine a role for NGOs without the uh, state authorities, whether they be national or international, it's not going to work. And the whole point of NGOs is that they go off and innovate and do things in, in a way that hasn't been pre-programmed. But in a situation where there is no international authority, I think it's pretty tough to blame the NGOs for the situation. Right. David Kennedy, I mean, this issue of just what NGOs can accomplish in difficult situations, and also the question of accountability. I wouldn't single NGOs out in that way. Uh, I have done some work in Haiti in the last year, and it was a, a situation which right from the beginning, 
a large number of people who've been involved both in the humanitarian aid community and also in the development community said, we're going to do this right this time. This is an opportunity to actually put all the pieces together in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think we have to say there have been heroic efforts by lots of people, a large deployment of resources, and a number of wonderful things have in fact happened in small scale. But it's a catastrophe. So it didn't work in anything like the scale that would be needed to do things differently. And so there's a it's a really interesting case study uh, for where the difficulties lie. And of course, there's something in saying they lie with the dysfunctionality of the local government, especially under the conditions of stress created by both poverty and, and calamity. There's something about the um, entrenched difficulties of the donor community. But I've been struck by one thing, and that is the combination of inability to govern the project of don donorship and NGO involvement and the lack of good ideas about how, in fact, to do things better. So if you look at the good governance problem only as a problem of Haiti, you're missing a big story. How does one govern the donors? They all have their own internal relationships, whether they're intergovernmental organizations or national governments or NGOs, they are in a very difficult relationship with one another and with a situation about which they may or may not be experts. Some of them have been there for many years and some arrived last week. There is no process for governing the donors if the national government doesn't do it. But there's no ability for the national government to do it if you need all those donors. And that's a difficult problem that can't be unraveled easily. And it's compounded by the fact, made very obvious in Haiti, that we do not have a science of how to bring about development or a science of how to bring about humanitarian aid in a satisfactory way. We have a lot of slogans about it. There are certainly a lot of political positions and preferences about it. But in fact, as an international community, we do not know what to do about either structural inequality right. or humanitarian disaster. And why can't the United Nations fill that vacuum? Because it doesn't, as things stand, have any responsibility for NGOs in countries like Haiti where they're operating. Well, I think there are a lot of proposals on the table for organizations who would nominate themselves to play the role of governing everybody else in the operation. But and surely the UN is best placed. And that would be one. One, might, I mean, the BBC tries to do that as no. well. So Please. the international media, uh, in many ways, sets itself up as the governor of the governing. Uh, we just... and, uh, so I think the, the, I, somebody ought to do it, but this, there is no somebody who knows how to do it. Not the and BBC, the that. UN. I think the UN. <laughs> okay, Stephen Chan, your answer to the question. <clears throat> Well, I agree very much with David Miliban that Haiti is a very, very singular example. It was a country in which nothing was ever going to work because of a whole range of conditions, some of which David outlined. But I also agree very much with David Kennedy and some of the points that he was making. But I have a very slightly different take on it. Uh, to a certain extent, this is a biased take because I left my position in organized international life 30 years ago after the cleanup in Uganda, um, precisely because of reasons of this sort. Uh, and that is, I don't think the international community understands what to do in situations of reconstruction underneath conditions of dire conflict, <clears throat> when you add in food deprivation and medical deprivation and everything else that makes a total catastrophe, then the position is compounded. I think what you've got here is a very, very fundamental problem, which is, to a certain extent, and I don't want to sound unnecessarily philosophical about this, but a problem of modernity. What happens when you try to make a compassionate response with an industrial solution? And I think that's the key question here, because all of the agencies who would go to work in countries or in situations that demand what we might traditionally call compassion do so with an industrial model. We'll mobilize X number of tons of this. We'll mobilize Y number of thousands of volunteers to do this. We will meet our own audit requirements. We've got all kinds of projects of salvation and redress that we can take off the shelf that are pre-prepared. We can insert them into the situation. We can make this work. We've got the plan. Uh, the problem is that when you have many agencies that have all got the plan, and who all try to make the plan function in an industrial, modern, efficient manner, 
there is no possibility of governance or government of the different plans and the different agencies who go into this kind of mix. And very often what you've got are situations which perpetuate the initial problem. Not so much Haiti, which I agree was a no-win case from the very beginning, but a very great deal, for instance, of the problems that are protracted and which continue in, say, a place like Darfur, are very much because the rebel groups are now fighting over who can control all the aid that comes in. And the more aid that comes in to help people who, in the first place, genuinely needed it, the more rebellion becomes a growth industry for its own sake. So you've got all kinds of, as it were, unintended consequences that get built into this. The more that there is, the more that there is that can also be taken by those for whom it was not originally intended. So it becomes, as it were, a gigantic informal sector, which is an unintended consequence of something which was too formalized and industrialized at the very beginning. Now, I say this to raise a question and to express in a very slightly different way what David Kennedy was saying. There is no immediate solution to this. There's no immediate model that we can put into the equation. And we would disappoint not only a budding industry, we would put a lot of people here at SOAS out of work, the technical experts, and we would disappoint a number of very idealistic people who volunteer to try to help in these situations. But it is time for a fundamental rethink. Everywhere I go, and I spend a lot of time in third world countries, so-called, uh, addressing issues such as this, but the model that has emanated from the West does not work. Gita, you wanted to come in? Yes, yeah, so, uh, just to reflect on some of the things that have been said and going back to the uh, question about international finan fin financial regulation, I agree with David that you have to have multiple structures in place and if there isn't a state that is ensuring basic um, infrastructure, it's going to be very, very hard because, because where you have a humanitarian disaster, um, you find a parasitic relationship between humanitarians coming in and employing quite often people who are the civil servants or the, you know, the local officials um, and, and bringing them in at much higher salaries. This happened after the tsunami in places like Sri Lanka, which does have a functioning state, uh, where um, precisely the giving of, you know, the, the, the goodness, you know, giving aid meant that uh, local structures and salary systems were destroyed. And yet you have humanitarian aid being delivered in a system which is basically using a neoliberal model of development and not allowing strong states to actually ensure basic rights for their people. And that's why you have the free-for-all. I mean, that, that is one of the underlying reasons that you have a free-for-all where people are just um, patching the immediate problems and not setting up a structure. And that's why if you, have a, if you have a medical system that works, you can bring down maternal mortality, you can begin to address it. But if you, you can't, just by thinking that you can patch specific um, initiatives only on maternal mortality without any kind of bigger medical system. Uh, the more I listen to this, uh, the more uh, it's a miracle that the really good things that David Kennedy referred to have happened. It is. Because a year is a very short time in the history of any uh, country. Uh, the, uh, we all know that the development of a society is something that takes deep roots, that takes many centuries, never mind many uh, decades, that can't be imposed uh, from outside. And to expect all those rules to be overturned in the space of a year seems to me to be uh, fallacious, really. The best you can hope for in the space of a year is to keep people alive. I think if you could, to plant deeper roots within a year seems to me to be a Herculean task. Stephen Hopgood, you asked the, the, that very question, and David Miliband says, actually, a year later, perhaps that is the best you can hope for, and actually it's pretty good. What do you think? Uh, the, well, there's no sign of any ongoing improvement, so we may have got through a year. We'll have to look at the situation in another year. Um, I'd like to tie the first three questions together and maybe sound a, a similar note across all three, which is all of them have been about the dispelling of illusions, disillusionment with diplomacy, with the international economy, and now with what the humanitarian industry can achieve. And that may well turn out to be a positive thing because growth comes, first of all, by getting past denial. And what we see in Haiti is a realization of the limits of what a technocratic Western civilization can develop and maybe some rethinking will come with that. Okay. Uh, audience, you, you know, you've really been asleep, haven't you? <laughs> Listening, I know, passively. So we'll perhaps get some response. Good. Some hands. Microphones, please. To the 
gentleman there in the grey suit, and then there's a chap there at the back, if you could position yourself next to him as well, microphone, and then there's another microphone here at the front. Oh, I've only got two. <laughs> All right. Who's got it? I can't see. Yeah, there you go. Introduce yourself, please, and your organisation, if relevant. I'm uh, Dan Plesh from the Centre for International Studies and Diplomacy. I would take issue with the idea that there is simply one Western industrialised model. I think there was a time when there was a much more social democratic international model that provided a much uh, more positive uh, backcloth for the development of the societies that we're talking about. And in particular, just from my own work, I would say even in the question of post-disaster, uh, uh, post-war reconstruction, the verdict of the UN uh, working in Germany before the Marshall Plan was that they ran all their refugee camps on democratically self-managed lines. And the verdict was they only worked because we never tried to manage them. That the resources were there, but they were organized in a self-managed way. That is hard to find anywhere in the modern, uh, in the current, I wouldn't say modern, in the current world. So it isn't just one modern uh, model. There are several. And the last point I would make is that I'm not a specialist on the region, but I did notice that there appeared to be a coup organized in Haiti in the early years of uh, the recent Bush administration in its first term, and whether or not that had uh, any effect on perpetuating uh, a kleptocratic class in that country and preventing the development of a uh, more effective governance in that particular uh, part of the world. Okay, you're referring there to the era of Jean-Bertrand Aristide. Okay, chap there in the red tie. <coughs> sorry, I've been listening to the panel discussing... Just introduce yourself, please. Oh, sorry. It'd be nice to meet you. My name you. is Conrad Chukudulue. I am a law student here. Um, I've been listening to the views that are being expressed about the difficulty with the multiplicity of NGOs trying to work in a catastrophe area, Haiti being a prime example at the moment. And I just wonder, how difficult is it for these organizations to actually coordinate their efforts without actually arriving on the field? How difficult, what, sorry? How difficult is it for them to actually coordinate their efforts before now mobilizing on the field? Is it, is it that impossible for them to sort of have a meeting about how they're going to run their affairs with the resources they have available to them mm. before they now arrive and start doing various things that different people don't know about? Well, I mean, I know certainly with Haiti that it's been the opposite, that actually there's so many assessments, isn't that right? And that a lot of the money goes into assessing the same thing over and over again, and that uses up an awful lot of money. And again, they sort of come down to the same problems. Assessments done. With no coordination. No coordination. No coordination. coordination. That, that is a problem. Yeah. Why can they not coordinate I mean, I think that is a recognized problem, isn't it? I mean, anybody who works on an NGO here, I mean, post-tsunami, the lessons should have been learned, but they weren't. You work for an NGO? So could you give a microphone to this chap here? You stay there, you come along here, yeah. So, <laughs> very active, just running the marathon. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I what, actually, what do you do? What do you, who, who are I you? I work for a humanitarian relief charity. So exactly in the field that you're talking about. We didn't actually do any work in Haiti, but we did a lot of work in Pakistan. Um, I don't think you can understate the problem of in-country infrastructure. I mean, it's fine to criticize NGOs for not being able to coordinate each other, but you can turn up and if there's nothing there, then it's very hard to be effective in, in the work you want to do. I mean, in Haiti, from what I understand, the, there was UN infrastructure there that would have been able to coordinate the relief effort, but that was completely destroyed by the earthquake. So it was essentially starting from scratch. In terms of Pakistan, you've got an ineffective government, so the, there's an issue there. Um, also, I mean, it was mentioned maybe the UN can take the role of coordinating NGOs, creating some kind of international governance. Yes, it is failing in that role, but charities are coming together to fulfill that role already. I'm working on uh, getting the organization I work for accreditation from the Humanitarian Accountability Partnership. So there are quality assurances out there which uh, are, you know, charities are moving to. Just to quickly put, pick up on what David said about good governance, uh, and also what Geese said about uh, neoliberal like policies being perpetuated. I think that's a particular issue. I mean, you mentioned good governance, but the way good governance is prescribed by Western democracies, by the UN, is essentially just a way of exposing economies like Pakistan, like Haiti, to 
external actors who aren't going to help them build up the essential health infrastructure, education infrastructure, relief in infrastructure, that means they won't require the level of help that has been seen in Haiti and Pakistan. Okay. Can I just say something? Yeah, do, of course. It's yeah. very interesting to hear the you know, man's testimonial. I mean, good governance to me is governance that is not corrupt, and so it serves the people that it's intended uh, for, that its appointments are based on merit, and so that there's some independence as to who wields uh, power, that it's accountable and transparent uh, in what it does. Those, to me, are not Western, neoliberal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're, they're just the right way to run a society. And so I think it's important that you distinguish between what is a, an institution and how, uh, and how it's run and what purposes it's then used for by its leaders. Because you, if you know Pakistan well, and it sounds like you do, you'll know that for the last 60 years, over the last 60 years, half the time it's been run by military rule. The institutions have been used either by the military or by civilian government for too little time by uh, civilian government. And so I don't think it's the notion of good governance that is corrupt or lacking in legitimacy. I think it's the way in which government structures are used. Okay. Our next question, Ryan Saadi, student here. Where are you, Ryan? Hello and good evening. Um, the UK and the US have recognized Kosovo as a state. Should they now follow Brazil and Argentina in recognizing uh, Palestine as a state? David Miliband. Well, the, uh, I mean, the, the phase two of the roadmap, which was published um, nearly a decade ago now, was for the uh, establishment of a uh, Palestinian state pending phase three, which would have been the final negotiations uh, over issues beyond borders. And one of the debates that's going on in the international community at the moment is whether or not you can recognize a state whose borders are ag agreed, but who, other aspects of whose constitution and other uh, are not. Um, I think it's uh, legitimate to argue that we should be vaulting to phase two of the roadmap, even though phase one, which included an end to all settlement activity, has not been achieved, tragically in my view, wrongly in my view. Um, I mean, the Kosovo example is different from the Palestinian one because actually the Palestinians have not declared independence. Uh, they say they might, though, now, yeah, haven't they, yeah, this month? Yeah. Well, the, the, well, no. Um, Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Palestine has set a two-year uh, trajectory to the achievement of the institutions of statehood, and he might then go to the UN at that point. The diff the, the, there are some st striking things. The Kosovans did declare independence. The Palestinians haven't. The Palestinians have representation in every capital. They have effectively an ambassador here, even though the Kosovans never did beforehand. So you've got, and you've got an international consensus that about what the basis of a Palestinian state should be. The way I would uh, phrase it would be as follows, that we need to, if we're going to make progress for the Palestinians, then there needs to be a regionalization of the drive in the Middle East for um, a peaceful resolution between Israel and its uh, neighbors. Because I don't think you'll get a Palestinian state without the Syrian and Lebanese issues also being addressed. So a re you've got to regionalize the political drive, but you've also got to internationalize the um, effort. Simply relying on the Americans alone is not enough. I'd like to see the EU and the UN doing more, actually, because that's the only way in which you're going to make progress. Okay, so if the Palestinians did unilaterally declare a state, just for the sake of argument, as Kosovo has, w should you recognize them? Well, the, the only answer that any sensible person can give is d it depends. And it depends on the circumstances at the time, doesn't it? Um, but I, what, what I would say to you, people think it's an incredibly radical thing. In fact, in the document that was written under the Bush administration, actually, the, the roadmap, phase two of the roadmap was for, the, for, for, for effective recognition of a Palestinian state before the final negotiations had concluded. And I think that the situation in uh, Palestine is so bad that all of those sort of ideas need to be properly addressed. David Kennedy. Well, I think I would be cautious. So I, I think that there's a, and I put on my international law hat here for a moment, um, there's, when you say recognize a Palestinian state, it sounds like something at once legally technical and also politically very important. And it would be both in some way. But there's a, it's easy to imagine that it's an automatic kind of thing or it's a, it has some kind of instantaneous effect or that there's an international law machine you can go to and get a validation sticker of some kind for your statehood as a way of avoiding the difficult kinds of procedures that, and discussions that David is putting on the table. I think it would, 
it's just unclear how such a, a, a declaration or such a recognition would fall onto a very complex political process. And that would be the reason for my caution. It would be possible to pursue in the international arena a kind of legal antifada. It would be possible to try to use international law in a variety of ways to stick the, a stick into the bicycle wheel in a variety of different situations in the hopes that one could unstick or reframe the negotiations in some way. But like an antifada on the ground, a legal antifada is extremely hard to control once it gets going and has very unpredictable outcomes and outcomes that can sometimes be absolutely different than what one anticipated. So it's easy to do something in international law because you think you're acting out of principle or because they did it someplace else that seems analogous without taking into account the way that doing will have an impact on and have fallout within a very difficult and fraught political situation. So I think it all depends is about the only thing one should say in such a situation. Stephen Chan, are you going to also give a qualified answer? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> it's partially qualified, but not quite so qualified. I mean, it's qualified to the extent that I would not use Kosovo as my uh, lead example. I think the independence that was recognized concerning Kosovo was so contingent and so disputed that that's not exactly the kind of model of independent recognition that you would seek for Palestine. But in the case of Palestine, in fact, here I tend to agree, I think, with what David Miliband was inferring when he was referring to the roadmap and the idea of recognition before final negotiations had concluded. In other words, a sort of preemptory move for want of another term. And I do think it does have to be at some stage and in some way preemptory, uh, despite all the problems that it would give rise to along the lines of what I think David Kennedy was suggesting. But I was in Jerusalem this time last year being taken through the different negotiating positions at quite high level. If you wait until all of those negotiations have refined themselves and come down to settled positions, uh, you and I are going to be extremely old people and it isn't going to happen. And the dream of some kind of entity for the Palestinians uh, is going to disappear. Where I think statehood as an entity does have very, very desirable consequences is that a recognized state, for all of the shortcomings that David has enunciated, a recognized state can negotiate better for itself than an entity that is not a recognized state. In other words, to a certain extent, you would then equalize the international playing field in terms of culpability and responsibilities and applications of law. And I think that's very, very important for the Palestinians as an entity to be able to say, look, we as a state have a certain legal personality and we demand of you, the State of Israel, also with a legal personality, to be treated in a way that legal personalities underneath international law are entitled. I think that preempting the situation and moving rapidly to that final part of the roadmap is a desirable diplomatic ambition. Gita? Well, I think this, it, yes, it could have um, enormous um, symbolic importance to have uh, uh, a Palestinian state recognized, but I wonder whether it'll actually stop um, or you know solve the problems that Palestinians actually face. I mean, does the recognition of a state actually endow them with the ability to have any form of sovereignty, particularly given the discussion we've been having about uh, the dis disjunct between um, uh, you know international financial and global regulation of various kinds and and national sovereignty? And do will the Palestinian state you know, be able to roll back the settlements? Will the wall come down? Um, or are some of the worst aspects of the current situation going to be actually uh, entrenched uh, in the form of recognition? So although I think that the, the intention of the Latin American countries that recognized um, uh, the Palestine as an independent state recently was presumably to try and, you know, push people back to the table and negotiations and so on, it might actually uh, in the long run have a detrimental effect. I mean, one can't tell. A response from the floor on this. What do you all think? Does Kosovo, if Kosovo, why not Palestine if it unilaterally declares independence? Lady here. Just take the microphone so people at the back I'm can really hear. glad that uh, Gita has added this point towards the end of the discussion because I think that talking about the state in the context of Palestine is not, I mean, we are not only dealing with the idea of a state, but we need a viable entity which 
could only be so if the settlements are gone, if the wall is dismantled, if people can move around, if there are borders, if there are uh, all kinds of things associated with the nation state and, and with sovereignty. So I think ultimately the question is <laughs> whether the recognition of a Palestinian state um, would carry with it also, um, you know, um, the enforcement of, on Israel uh, to recognize international law and resolutions. This, I mean, we cannot talk about recognizing a state without, um, you know, taking into account that Israel has also to be involved into this process and to be forced to recognize. So if everybody recognized, it would be no good if other countries recognized I don't Palestine, think, I mean, if it, Israel it be a fake, uh, you know, a fake process again. I mean, we need to give mm. some content okay. and some viability. And in order for this to happen, Israel should be enforced to, okay. uh, you know, um, to, 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 to make this possible state viable, which, you know, which means sovereignty, borders, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. So you don't get the Swiss cheese state with the hills. Okay. Uh, yeah, later there. Hi, Lynn Welshman from the School of Law. <clears throat> I wanted to follow on what Rubar said as well. But to add a bit, I agree absolutely um, that the question is very interesting, but it can become a question that we can talk about in terms of theory and when it applies and when it's a useful negotiating strategy and when does real estate to come. There has to be land to have a state on. There isn't a lot of land left now, as we know. Um, and so the question really would be, is there not something that surely the US, the EU, we all know the question, surely something must be possible to do to stop the settlements, to stop the confiscation of land with the alienation of even the prospects of the establishment of a viable state, which is the only way a viable state has to be a durable state and a peaceful state. And in the meantime, there is a certain amount already of uh, legal intifada, if you like, that is going on in terms of assertion or attempts to assert universal jurisdiction for the international criminal prosecution or prosecution internationally of those accused of grave breaches of the 14th Convention against protected Palestinian civilians, which is one thing that is not under the control, theoretically, of states where Palestinians and their allies would seek to have redress and recourse under international law. Even that is being blocked, including by this country, where states are capable to do it, to try to stop, to have to have the Attorney General's permission. Um, I'm saying this because it started in the last Labour government, of which I was a great supporter, and, although not on their policy on Palestine necessarily, um, and it's continuing with this government to change the criminal procedure law in that regard. And what happens there is that you have the possibility of Palestinians try to activate legal mechanisms and legal strategies if you block those at every stage, it means that you are not allowing people to try to make the most of international law as a remedy. And then where are people supposed to go except to politics where the one side is so much stronger than the other, then what happens? You have to think this, you have to let law work or something work. I'm sorry, I'm getting a bit um, You cracked a lot cross. in your... <laughs> I'm a lecturer, I have, it's you, awful, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> very impressive. You've not drawn breath. Your students must be job. scribbling That's away <laughs> as you're speaking. Any other points, please, from the floor? Okay. Um, David Murray, did you want to pick up on that Well, point um, thanks for your support for the government, uh, obviously, or the, 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 the former government. You're not the government anymore. Uh, yeah. The former government. <laughs> um, I think it's important that, um, just, just so that David Kennedy doesn't get the wrong idea, the, um, there's no question of changing the uh, level of evidence that's required for a prosecution under the uh, universal jurisdiction. Uh, and there's no question of raising the bar at which um, uh, prosecution should take place. The question is, should there be a different bar for an arrest than for a, uh, a prosecution? So it's, it's a sort of kind of a technical, it's, it actually only applies in England, not in Scotland. It's a peculiarity of English law. I think there's a more general point I'd like to make though about the Middle East issue and about the Palestinian issue in particular. And funnily enough, there was an editorial in The Economist last week, which I think everyone should actually read. It was really important. And it's the fundamental issue is this. James Baker said in 1991, Secretary of State James Baker, he said that it was not right or it was impossible for the rest of the world to want a solution more than the parties themselves. It's a very profound thing. In other words, you can't force people to compromise. Now, the argument of The Economist last week, and it's an argument that I've made myself in various fora, is that actually, if you believe that the failure to resolve the Palestinian issue is a fundamental source of insecurity and instability and extremism and killing, 
around the world that the rest of us can suffer, maybe we, it is legitimate for us to care more about the solution than the parties themselves. And therefore, it's legitimate for us to consider what we're willing to do to make a solution happen. Now, it's actually a very radical thing to, and it's a big Rubicon to cross, but I would say that anyone here who is a student of international relations needs to think through that fundamental issue because my own judgment is that left to themselves, the negotiators will not be able to uh, achieve uh, a uh, sort of resolution because a compromise has become a dirty word in uh, the Israeli political system in a quite a dangerous way. And on the Palestinian side, the division between West Bank and Gaza uh, means that the legitimacy of President Abbas is severely under threat. Now, that creates the circumstances where we all have to think what responsibilities are we willing to take to ourselves or to our own countries or to international institutions in order to force the pace on a solution beyond the speed at which the uh, leaders of the individual states or states to be are willing to go. Okay, just one final point. David Kennedy, one thing I wanted to ask you, which is you talked about how international law is, is quite muddled on, you know, what is a state and what isn't it? I mean, why, why is it so muddled? Why does southern Sudan get the chance to vote for independence in a referendum, whereas Somaliland, breakaway state for two decades in Somalia, functioning in all but name as a state and nobody recognizes it, Kosovo, why not Palestine and so on. There is a great deal of lack of clarity, isn't there, in international law? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and why, why can't clever brains like you do something about it then? Because well, you I are think, I think a practitioner. I think there's a very important strategic question for international lawyers, which is what is the strategic value for us of our own clarity? So you could imagine that there is something to offer the world in a vernacular for carrying on political conversations that's plastic enough to embrace a variety of different positions and to innovate a variety of different solutions that turn out to be very context appropriate rather than parallel across the world. The idea that everybody needed a state that would be exactly the same shape and have exactly the same form had an emancipatory dimension and took legal form but we've learned it's not the right solution in every place to every problem, and the effort to try to universalize it brought with it as many difficulties as it, as it brought advantages and emancipatory opportunities politically. So I think international lawyers have learned that one size doesn't fit all, and that means our project as a profession is a much more complicated one that has to be done in a relationship with political and economic arrangements. The one thing I'd say about, about Palestine is this. Um, I, myself, I've found myself abandoning the idea of a two-state solution and abandoning the idea of a push for any kind of resolution in the immediate uh, political horizon, precisely because I don't think the position, David, that you just articulated is uh, likely to prove realistic. I think it's very unlikely, politically, that either a, a solution that would be stable and plausible will be pushed or urged on the parties by the most important political players uh, in the international community, nor do I believe any state for Palestine that could be negotiated would be one that would be worthy of the name for all kinds of different reasons and would simply entrench in state form a variety of structural inequalities that in the long run would be unsustainable. Uh, and so. My own sense is that we've, we've locked ourselves into a, per, a perceptual, a per, sort of perpetual conversation, the horizon for which is not a good idea anyway. Uh, and in that sense, it's maybe not a mistake that people have been so loath to adopt it on the ground. And um, what would you, what, 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 so you'd go for, for what uh, 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 instead? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually yes. quite puzzled about what the strategic vision of the Israeli right actually is. So it would be very interesting to hear a kind of, in, well, in the you. sense of grand you. strategy, what do they expect to have? It seems to me they're on a road that is... Um, no, there are two different, there are two different, if, you, if, if you're interested, there are two different views. Yeah. One is, 
you hang in there long enough that in the end, the Egyptians are forced to take Gaza and the Jordanians take the West Bank. Mm -hmm. That's one um, idea that they've got. I'm obviously not recommending it, but it's, I mean, there'd be huge. Uh, second idea is that they cling to Judea and Samaria as the um, land of Israel. And, and population it's all, transfer, yeah. And population transfer to go with it. Yeah. And that's the, that, so, so there, is, there are alternative, quote unquote, solutions out there. My own judgment is that they are, whatever the risks of a two state solution, they're worse. Now, you're right that the political prospects are, are not good at the moment. And people have been making speeches about the window is closing for a two state solution for five or ten uh, years, and, and eventually the window does close. But if, if you believe, as I do, that this is a massive source of um, instability around the world, that the injustice of the, that the Palestinians suffer is a massive recruiting sergeant for some of the most deadly forces around the world, then you've got to be concerned about throwing up your hands and saying, oh, well, a two-state solution isn't going to happen. And I think it's very significant that countries, including my own, um, three years ago, we said for the first time, President Obama said it for the first time for the United States, that it was in the national interest of the United States to have a two-state solution. That is a big thing to say. Because if it's in your national interest, that means you, you, you're responsible to making it happen. And I think we should, we should live up to that. Anything, anybody else want to say? Okay, yeah, do. Quick microphone, because we've got a couple more questions before we run out of time. Hi, I'm Bill Fryer. I'm with the SOAS Communications Office. Um, I have some questions from Twitter that I've been trying to find a way to work into the discussion. So I'm hoping I can ask these uh, to broaden this last question uh, a little bit about um, uh, statehood and human rights. Uh, two, two questions. First for David Miliband, uh, have the human rights of islanders in places such as Chagos and St. Helena uh, been compromised by UK foreign policy? And uh, one for, for the whole group, uh, would we ever see a Kurdish state? Okay, let's just take the Kurdish state, since we're already on states, the putative ones or otherwise, and the Chagos Islands one very quickly though. Uh, don't worry, David, it would be a very brief response because we've still got more to do. Um, what was the question about the other state? Which state was it? Kurdish. Oh yeah, the Kurdish state. <laughs> Kurdistan. Is there a, should there be a Kurdistan? What presumably incorporating the bits of Iraq, bits of Syria, and bits of Turkey, bring them all together? Is that what Done. you mean? Iran. And Iran? All of them. Okay. So it sounds like it's not just the northern part of Iraq that this question is about, but the Kurds, wherever they exist in these four countries, neighboring countries. I'll just say something very quick. I was just in Erbil last month, and that's not part of the discussion among the Kurdish leadership in the Kurdish region of Iraq at the moment. Um, and so I, it's not something that seems to me to be a politically active uh, question. In fact, there's a gigantic rapprochement underway between Turkey and the Kurdish region of Iraq and Iraq more generally, as there is between Iran and Iraq and a variety of other reasons and for other purposes. So it doesn't seem to me to be a question that, that is, the horizon for answering the question would demand a kind of prognostication that's beyond what one can see now. Okay. Stephen Chandler, want to respond on that Kurdistan, Kurdish state? Well, very briefly, just to agree with David Kennedy, I think that's quite right. I mean, provided the rapprochement is well managed uh, for a long time to come, and all kinds of developmental benefits keep flowing to this uh, region, uh, not just in terms of Turkey and Iraq, but also all of the other countries that have, as it were, some interest there as well. Yes, the position can be kept stable. Now, having said that, it's also one of these positions that could quite easily become inflamed in the future. So just because there's some stasis there now and the situation is manageable now doesn't mean that this question can then be left to posterity. It may return to haunt us sooner rather than later. So this one does demand a watching brief. Ita, do you want to make a comment on this? Briefly. Well, I, I think I agree with that. I think th th that a lot of the um, Kurdish nationalists have actually settled for fighting for more autonomy within the states that they're in. Um, and what's interesting about Iraq is that uh, the Kurdish region has really served as a, a, a beacon in, in, uh, of relative peace. I mean, the women are, who are active over there are embattled with their own regional authority, but they have a much better situation than women in the rest of Iraq, and they've actually led the way in terms of holding discussions and 
um, changing the law and a number of things. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a complex picture, but it's an interesting example of a, of a region that's historically felt you know, hugely um, done down. I mean, you know, it just had uh, genocidal policies pursued against it, but it has recovered uh, to be able to actually create a leadership role um, within the country. David Miliband, Kurdish, st Kurdish state either well, within Northern Iraq? Well, I was asked directly on uh, Chagos Islanders. The, the, there was a grave injustice done in the 50s and 60s uh, f for which successive British governments have offered profuse apologies and for which compensation was paid. Uh, there are still issue, issues going in front of the European Court of Human Rights uh, for the right of islanders to go back, and that's perfectly legitimate that they should be able to pursue those through the courts. Um, I think on the, uh, one of the most remarkable things in my time as Foreign Secretary was the uh, change in the relations between Northern Iraq and Turkey. And I, w uh, I spent some time of my own working uh, for that, and it's very, very significant. And the uh, latest discoveries of gas in um, northern Iraq um, will only serve to promote the sort of cooperation across state lines that I think is very, very beneficial to both sides. Didn't they? Here we are at Suez. I'm sure some history prof professor can tell us. I mean, after the Ottoman Empire was disbanded at the end of the First World War, the Kurds were all brought together, I think, in London, weren't they, and asked if they wanted a state, and they couldn't agree amongst one another because they're all a bit different, aren't they, the Turkish Kurds and the... Iraqi Kurd, a different language almost, I think, in many cases. Am I right in saying that? Yes? Good. Okay. Yeah, very quickly, and then we need to move on. Sorry, uh, my name is Nadia Al Ali, and I just wanted to come in. I, I agree that it's not a, a political issue right now and something that's, um, you know, fought for, but I think on the level of ordinary Iraqi Kurds, certainly, they think of themselves as Kurdistani right now. And I think there's an increasing problem that there's a tension between the political leadership and people on the That's ground who are increasingly getting frustrated. You know, politicians who are part of the liberation movement who are now doing real politics and the Iraqi Kurdish population do not feel okay, represented by them good anymore. Point, yeah. And that's the, the other side of the question on the Twitter, which is just that northern Iraq part. And of course, if the president of a united Iraq is Jalal Talabani, a Kurd himself, then we take your point. Okay, uh, question, Professor Anadia Al-Ali, Professor of Gender Studies and Chair of the Center for Gender <laughs> Studies. <laughs> right on cue again. Mm -hmm. There are lots of professors at this thing, isn't it? I feel quite outnumbered. I'd have to go a bit closer to you, David Miliband. <laughs> This yeah. side, <coughs> right. On. Okay, um, on January 1st, 2011, uh, UN Women, which is a new body, UN body dedicated to gender equality and women's empowerment, uh, officially began its work. And according to the World Health Organization, gender-based violence continues to be a massive health and human rights issue throughout the world. So I'd like to ask the panel, what should we do to fight gender-based violence globally? Okay, Gita, very important thing, of course, GBV. What can we do about fighting it globally? Well, <clears throat> a lot of my friends were involved with arguing for this new entity, and I must say that uh, I've always been very skeptical about whether having a more powerful entity is really going to make much difference on the ground. The reason for this is not that it doesn't do good work. It obviously uh, does support women's organizations in various places, um, different branches of the UN do, uh, in combating gender-based violence and changing the law and so on. But I think they're the two larger questions where um, parts of the UN, parts of the international financial institutions are actually doing things that are detrimental to women's rights and therefore to uh, reducing gender-based violence. And there are two broad things. One is the infrastructural issues that we talked about earlier, that states are basically being told to dismantle such infrastructure as they have. And um, as we are, as you said, David, we're discussing in Britain at the moment whether everything can be run by the voluntary sector or not. I think the, the possibility of a state deciding on some kind of social democratic solution where it ensures basic rights for its people has really diminished. And I don't think women's rights can be seen as separate from that. So there's a large infrastructural question. The other one is this issue of international financial regulation because marching alongside that and virtually unnoticed, um, uh, the, the World Bank some years ago had a commission called Legal Empowerment for the Poor. And one of the things that um, they basically decided to do, and I'm going to give you a very crude account of it, but I think it is almost that crude, 
what's going on is that um, uh, <clears throat> uh, a, a lot of the rule of law projects, um, and, and there's, some, there's some very good ones which are about improving the functioning of courts and so on, but one large part of the functioning of courts is about getting poor people and family law and women basically out of the court system so that they don't clog up the courts with you know litigation and divorce and custody and various other issues and all this is to be put into something called ADR alternative dispute resolution or alternative systems or strengthening and the UN is doing some seriously dangerous work working with jirgas and other things apparently to strengthen their human rights capacities but actually completely against what local human rights advocates are fighting for. That's a really, really dangerous long-term development because at the same time, governments have also allied with fundamentalists in various ways. And I'm talking about Western governments promoting them abroad, uh, including the Labour Party during the Labour administration um, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and um, Bangladesh and so on, uh, precisely because they really believe that um, uh, you know, if you're going to contain terrorism, that you have to put some sort of fundamentalist in charge to keep most of the Muslim population in check. Um, and so at the same time as doing these rule of law projects, you're actually getting forces in who are promoting blasphemy laws um, and so on and so on. So, and, and in the UN itself is being undermined from within with resolutions on defamation of religion and so on. And I think these things are not usually taken into account right. when you're looking at gender-based violence and what's happening uh, to women's rights generally. They, these things are seen as separate from women's rights and they're absolutely central to whether women's rights can be achieved within a structure where women are actually subjects of human rights and actually citizens, full citizens of their countries. You have to find a way of mobilizing political leadership in some way and making sure you've got the right leadership to try to address. Well, I, th I think these things have been put into completely separate boxes of discussion, and I think they need to be brought More together. Integrated. Okay, <laughs> running short of time, so can I ask you to keep your comments relatively brief, sadly, on such a, a key issue, but Stephen Chan? I think, I think the issue is very, very much one to do with citizen rights, not something which can be compartmentalized very, very easily, but something which is very much to do with the rights of all people, irrespective of gender or any other kind of demarcation. And I think this is absolutely key, and the constitutionalized rights of all citizens, which demands some kind of state edifice as well. I think that's an expectation that everybody should have. I think it was an expectation my parents had when they were refugees wandering the world looking for a constitutionalized location in which they could settle and bring up their children. It's something which is an expectation, I think, of hundreds of people here at SOAS. And I really do... Uh, feel a bit tired sometimes of grand universal declarations. I think there are all kinds of myriad problems at local levels that demand all kinds of very, very detailed local ways of addressing them, but all very much within the rubric of your rights as a constitutionalized citizen. Okay, David Kennedy, what can we do about GBV? I mean, we have to address this climate of impunity and, and get but, women to seek redress to this kind of violence. Certainly, but I think the, the idea that when the UN has taken up the issue, we should feel something's positive is not one that I find often seems correct. Um, I, I, I think we miss two important points when thinking about gender violence as something that can be internationalized and legalized in that way, either from an administrative or from a normative point of view. The first is, that a very particular idea about gender justice and a particular idea, often a criminalization idea, uh, about gender violence is what has been taken up by the international public legal order in the name of addressing gender violence. In our own societies, we know that that's a component of a much larger set of issues and a much larger set of policies that needs to be considered together with other things. So very often when things get promoted to the international level, they get reduced to something, to one particular kind of intervention that may not be the most wise. And the second is the point that Gita, I think, very importantly put on the table. International law has a puzzling way of imagining that all the norms that have to do with women have the word woman in them. And that's just not right. The most important normative structures affecting the status of women and the possibilities for women in the world are not written in codes about women. They're written in financial regulations and in a variety of different other forms of law and forms of political life, 
that people with economics phobia and math phobia still tragically need to find out about. Uh, and so I would encourage those who care about gender justice to become engaged across a wider range of issues and to come, become engaged across a wider range of tools than those that are customarily available at the UN and international public law level. I mean, you say that, I mean, that's true, but I mean, everybody's critical of the fact that Michelle Bachelet has been set up as this new UN Supremo for women and Margot Wallstrom, the UN Special Envoy, to increase recognition of the fact that sexual violence is used as a, a tool and consequence of um, conflict. I mean, surely that's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, that that is being done. It's not sufficient, that's a point. It's not it's sufficient, not, but um, I mean, is the there, UN their dues I, I'm on that? I mean, sure. it, it, isn't sure it good to actually. just increase recognition of this? But anyway, David Miliband, your response well, it is. Look, this is a massive issue. Hillary Clinton put out a statement or made a speech last year in which she said that three out of ten women in the world would suffer violence in the course of their lives. I mean, that is an absolutely staggering uh, statistic. Uh, I'd say two things about it. One, the questioner talked about fighting it globally. Uh, I wonder if that's right. I think we're better off fighting it locally. And maybe that speaks to this UN point. You know, the, the violence that suffered in the Eastern, in the Kivus, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I mean, you can pass as many resolutions as you like at the UN, but unless it's fought, uh, sexual violence is fought locally, it's not going to change. And I think that it's only um, uh, through local engagement. Where there has been progress, Hillary cited this in her speech actually last year, uh, has been places where men as well as women have taken on the task of uh, tackling it. And I think that that's quite important. The second thing is I wonder if it's right to say that women's rights should just be subsumed as a, in wider citizens' rights. And I say that as the only politician on the platform in the following sense. This is partly a political issue, fighting for attention, fighting for priority, fighting for funding, and... There may be all sorts of academic arguments that I'm not aware of about why women's rights should be subsumed in a wider constitutional order of citizens' rights or civilian rights. But as a politician, I would say to you, I would think that is probably a bad move. The, the, the statistics and the, real, the, life, the lives that are being distorted by this violence, are the numbers are so great, I would... I think we're going to make more progress if we keep its specificity and its singularity rather than subsume it into a wider set of citizens' rights arguments. That's just my political judgment. Because we're running short of time. Do you want to just a very quick response to that? I agree. So oh, I think You've I, changed your mind. No, That's I, quick. No, no. I no. think that it, from a political point of view, one wants to keep the question of gender justice alive in its specificity, but one wants to address it in a way that's broad gauge <laughs> and that's not, that doesn't isolate the remedies or globalize them and that he treats them in a very differentiated and local way. So I see myself as agreeing both with what I... So, what oh, diplomatic person you are qualified. Very briefly, response, yeah. I've um, got one more question. Well, I wish David would have said the thing about local, not global, when it came to women's rights in Afghanistan and Iraq. Because I think there, um, when I'm asked the question, I'm thinking, I'm very conscious of the fact that actually sort of global uh, intervention in terms of women's rights, gender empowerment, has actually created a backlash against women's rights and empowerment and from what I have studied and seen in Iraq has actually created a backlash in greater gender-based violence. And I also think that the UN, I mean, I'm asked this question because I personally think that in contexts like Palestine and Iraq, where the UN has been so discredited, of course the UN is not going to be able to, um, you know, make any kind of positive uh, intakes where women's rights are concerned. Okay. All right. Very briefly, final question. Croft and Black, Secret Prisons and Extraordinary Renditions Investigator for Reprieve Human Rights Organization that uses law to enforce human rights of prisoners. Where are you? Yeah, there. thank you. Um, does the panel agree that we are safer as a result of the use of torture in counter-terrorism operations in recent years? Okay. Let's, just vote. Let's, let's just vote. <laughs> no, just, yeah, what a sentence. Are we safer? I mean, waterboarding, George Bush admitted, used that on Khadi Sheikh Mohammed, the uh, mastermind of 9-11, so-called mastermind, that kind of thing. Okay. I don't know, but my intuition is certainly not. <laughs> Stephen? I don't think we're safer. I think it just breeds far, far greater discontent and resentment. Uh, we're asking for trouble 
Lita? I, I very much doubt we're safer, and um, in any cases, we all know there has been a huge and justified fight back uh, to, uh, against the attack on the, the uh, absolute prohibition on torture. Um, and I think that was a very important fight back. But uh, I do think that the main, one of the main issues uh, the, that, that has really been left largely unaddressed is that because people were dumped in a law-free zone in Guantanamo and many other de uh, detention centers, um, they weren't put before a proper court. We don't have proper accountability for ma many people who should have been in front of a court, like Khalid Mohammed Sheikh, have not yet been in front of a court. And other people have been uh, treated as martyrs and as perfect victims when actually they should have been put in front of a court. That doesn't justify the torture. Okay. David uh, no, uh, the answer is no. Uh, torture is abhorrent, it's illegal, and it's perverse in its effects. I don't think it's a difficult question to answer. I think it's a very easy one. Okay, good. Just as long as we haven't got much time. Final, quick, final question from Katriona Drew from this centre, the director of this centre. This centre. <laughs> Shall I spell it out? Uh, <laughs> thank you. Students who come to SOAS famously want to change the world. Which of the panelists' career paths would most allow them to do this, and why? <laughs> okay, so just... <laughs> Very briefly, Gita, I'll work my way down. Well, I couldn't even change Amnesty International, so I've singularly <laughs> failed to change the world. Um, I think being a filmmaker was, uh, is probably the, the most um, useful thing that I've done in terms of a huge widespread impact on hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people. Just say quickly what it was, just quickly. Well, for instance, my film on um, uh, war crimes, which, uh, uh, in which we investigated three British Bangladeshis, uh, some of whom had many breakfasts with the Prime Minister and so on, who became partners in the war on terror, but we investigated them okay. uh, for very serious allegations. So filmmaker crimes. is your answer. Okay. Yep. David Milliband. Well, my first career aspiration was to be a London bus conductor, and uh, <laughs> they don't even have bus conductors on London buses uh, anymore. <laughs> I, I would strongly defend the integrity of politics as a fundamental way in which to change the world. I think politics is an honourable and vital vocation. And it's a vocation that needs people of all ages, backgrounds, and uh, views. And I think that when the political realm loses its uh, sense of vitality and integrity, then our societies have no chance of improvement. So you're not moving to the BBC then? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Is, that... <laughs> Is that right? You're staying a politician, are you? Absolutely. I'm, I've always said that I'm going to serve my constituents in South Shields. And but they... you might moonlight a bit. <laughs> about moonlighting that's a rather um, derogatory <laughs> way of putting it sorry i think some might. people might consider me moonlighting now rather than voting on the european union bill which is going through the house of commons just as we speak so you don't want my job that's good <laughs> i could never do your job as well as you do <laughs> david kennedy it's when you try and do my job that the trouble <laughs> <I don't> starts <laughs> David Kennedy. Well, I don't think we need to choose just one. So I think one of the things that's come out in the course of the evening and the, and the very interesting kinds of discussions that are organized by the center here are the variety of ways in which people can try to become effective. Uh, I had the idea early in my career to be Henry Kissinger for good, um, and uh, <laughs> that didn't work out <laughs> so well. And I became convinced that changing ideas is, is an important way in which the world also changes. So, but I, I think being an agent of change is not about finding the right slot. It's about finding the right passion. Okay, and final word to our very own SOAS Professor Stephen Chan. Uh, well, sometimes I think my life has been a complete failure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been involved in, in many things in my life. I began life as a diplomat and, and as a peacekeeper. Uh, and then came on to being an academic. I'm not sure I've changed anything at all, but some small things sometimes do give, as it were, interim satisfaction. Uh, and I suppose I could conclude with some of the small things. I mean, uh, when Zedar Band, David Miliband and I were in Trinidad at the end of 2009 uh, at the Commonwealth Conference, uh, I took a day off and went down to the slum areas and wound up financing the slums Christmas party. Uh, which we've done again uh, this year, uh, this uh, last Christmas just gone by. Uh, 
uh, it's a small gesture. It cost almost nothing in our terms, in terms of British currency. Uh, brought a great deal of happiness. I'm not sure whether that's brought peace to anybody. These are violent areas. Uh, sometimes I think that if you can leave, as it were, at least a smile on people's faces, even for a short time, it's better than nothing. Otherwise, it's very often nothing. Okay, thank you very much. I just button up the evening for you now. Stephen Chan, David Kennedy, David Miliband, Geeta Sagal, thank you all very much. And thank you to you too. Bye-bye.